just a few years back, matter of fact, I think it was 2015, there was a scrap dealer that had a man that brought in uh, a, just a little object and this thing only stood about three and a half inches tall, but it was made out of gold and that was obvious. And the guy wanted to sell it to him for scrap. And he looked at that and he determined the amount of gold that he believed would be in it. And he says, I tell you what, I can give you $14,000 for this. And he was hoping that by melting it down and turning it back in, that he could get about $14,500 out of it. It's the biggest one single purchase that he had ever made before. Before he started to melt that down, he noticed that there was a name written on it. And when he looked at that name, he looked it up and he found out that this was a Fabergé egg that belonged to the Royal Russian family that had come up missing years and years and years ago. You know what that egg was worth? $33 million. Can you imagine that? $33 million. He was just about to destroy that. It's fascinating to hear stories like that where someone has uh, found a valuable treasure, something that has been hidden for quite some time. I <clears throat> enjoy watching the uh, show Oak Island on TV. And here is a group of men that are searching for a, a buried treasure. It's been on that island for years and years and years, and people went to great lengths to try to hide that. Uh, one of the things they think could possibly be there, they have no idea really, but they think because of the Knight Templars down through the years that had used that, that maybe even the Ark of the Covenant as it was taken from uh, the temple years and years and years ago could possibly be there. But they are searching and searching and searching. They have found that money pit, but they just haven't been able to get down to that money pit at this time. In 1511, a Portuguese ship sank with 200 chests of precious stones on there. And some of those chests were full of diamonds that were anywhere from a half inch in size to fist size. Can you imagine being able to find that? Years ago during World War II, the Nazis stole what was known as an amber room. And nobody's found that yet. People are still looking for that today. So there's all kinds of valuable treasures out there that are lost, still waiting to be found. In 2 Kings chapter 22, there is a very valuable treasure that was found as well. And even though that Fabergé egg may have been worth $33 million, I can tell you that the treasure that we're talking about today is worth far more than that. It's worth more than anything that you find on this earth. Just a little background, a man by the name of Manasseh has been king. And this man is just simply described as a man that did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He worshiped Baal, Asherah, the stars. This Jewish king even went so far as to sacrifice one of his sons in the fire. Uh, he practiced sorcery. He contacted mediums and spiritists. And any type of idolatry that you want to think about, he was doing that at that time. The scripture says that he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood. So people that did not deserve to die, he saw that indeed they were put to death. Well, it finally comes to the end of his life and he dies. Luckily, there is a son to take over. This son was not sacrificed in the flames and his name is Josiah. And Josiah is going to become king when he is only eight years old. And yet immediately what it's going to say about Josiah is that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. And what that says to me about Josiah is that he must have had a pretty good mama. His mother must have taken very good care of him. She helped him to learn what was right and what was wrong. But I want you to realize that there was a whole lot going on in Israel that wasn't right. The people were not even close to doing what they should have done. There was still a high priest. His name is Hilkiah. People still went to the temple. I don't know what they were doing at that temple. 
They didn't really even know who God was and what God wanted them to do. They still put their money in a box in the temple. So they were still giving of their money. So the point in time comes when Josiah says, we're going to take the money that's in that box and we're going to use that money to repair the temple. So they wanted that building to look nice. They weren't thinking about really about I'm supposed to be doing in this building, but we want a good looking building. And so that's what they set out to do. And as they hired carpenters, builders, and masons, it says that these were men that acted faithfully, so they were going to use the money properly. They weren't going to waste the money at all. And they go in there and they start making the repairs. And as they are tearing down a wall in order to rebuild that wall and replace the wall, they found the greatest treasure, the book of the law. It is amazing to me that here is a nation that is devoted to worshiping God and they didn't know what God's word was. So the first thing we find is that the high priest is going to take a look at it. And again, that's Hilkiah. And then after Hilkiah is done looking at it, then he's going to give it to the uh, secretary, and that is Shaphan. And Shaphan is going to give it to the king, and the king is going to read it as well. And when the king reads it, it says he tore his robes. Yeah, he's wearing royal robes, but that doesn't make any difference. He is reading something that he realizes is the word of God, the things that Moses had passed on to the Israelites years and years and years ago, but nobody knows it. It's forgotten. Nobody has a copy of it to look at and to think about. And so what he says is that we need to inquire of the Lord, for we have not acted in accordance with all that is written here. Well, here's what God's response to that inquiry was. This is verses 19 and 20. Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourselves before the Lord when you heard what I have spoken against this place and his people, that they would become accursed and laid waste. And because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, I will gather you to your fathers and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster I'm going to bring on this place. There's God's answer. Now, Josiah, you have read the book. And in the book, you have found a lot of things that you are supposed to be doing and not doing. But now that you have read the book, you've also find that there are punishments and curses for the people when they don't follow that. But Josiah, because you have changed your mind, because you have wept over the wrongs that you see, and because you have a desire to restore back God's way of doing things, then I'm not going to bring those curses about in your lifetime. So you heard me use the word restoration there just a moment ago. And I think this is an extremely important chapter to stop and to think about this idea of restoration. Well, what is restoration? Restoration. Dictionary definition is the act or process of returning something to its original condition by repairing it or cleaning it. Or it is the act of bringing something back that existed before. Josiah wants to restore God's law. It existed. It's been hidden in the wall. Nobody knows what it says. It's far gone from people's mind. They're going through some role about religion, but they're not really doing what God said that he wanted done. We understand restoration. We all know people that will take uh, antique furniture and restore it. We know people that will take an old car or an old tractor, and they want to make that item right back just exactly like it was on the day that it was bought. We've seen where people will take an old house uh, maybe it's like a Civil War mansion or something like that, and they want to put everything back in it just like it was. They want to get rid of all the modern features of it and just get it right back to the way it was on the day that it was built. Josiah is going to go through the process of restoration. The first three verses of chapter 23 read like this. Then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem, 
He went up to the temple of the Lord with the men of Judah, the people of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commands, regulations, and decrees with all his heart and all his soul, thus confirming the words of the covenant written in this book. Then all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. Josiah says, we have read this book. It was read aloud in their hearing. And now what we are going to do is we're going to start doing what this book says to do. So there has been a period in history that they have not done that. And so now they are going to start doing that at that very point in time. We find in verses 4 through 20, the removal of all the idols, the shrines, the altars, the high places, all the worship of Baal, the asteros, they are now gone. In verses 21 to 23, we find that the Passover is going to be reinstituted. It's been years since the Israelites have practiced the Passover. And in verses 24 and 25, he simply says, we are now going to do what the Lord says to do. Verse 25 reads, Neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his strength in accordance with all of the law of Moses. So his heart was right. But now we also are finding out that indeed he is going to be doing exactly what the law says. Now I ask the question, is restoration possible today as far as Christianity is concerned? Well, it is very evident that Josiah, Hilkiah the high priest, and Israel did that at that point in time. There's a lot of questions. Here's just some random questions that we could ask to people on the street, and you get lots and lots of different answers to these things. Does the Bible answer such questions as these? Well, how do you become a Christian? Or what are the biblical names for Christians? Or what's the biblical names for the church? Well, who is the head of the church? How is the church supposed to be organized? And how do you worship as a Christian? When's the church supposed to meet? What's the Lord's Supper all about? How's the church supposed to be financed? What's the purpose of the church? I believe that we can go to God's word and find the answer to all of these things. And if we can do that, we can do the same thing that they were doing at the very beginning. I can remember in high school reading about the idea of the dark ages. Well, what I didn't know until much later on, the Dark Ages really got his name from the fact that God's word was hidden. If there was a copy of the scriptures, it would have been found in a church building and it would have been chained to a pulpit and the common man was not allowed to read it. And so the only thing people knew was whatever was told them by the people that was trying to lead them religiously. We come along a little later on in what is known as the Reformation Movement, and there are some people that began to look at what was being practiced in the name of Christianity and began to look at the Bible and say, this doesn't match up. There are some things that need to be changed. And indeed, during that time frame, you begin to get the Bible into the common people's hand as well. And a little later on, it becomes what is known as the Restoration Movement, where people began to say, and this is a movement that has taken place in various parts of the world, and certainly there was the Restoration Movement within the United States as well. But let's just simply say, let's know what God's Word says well enough that we can simply do what God's Word says and not follow man's teachings or man's opinions, just simply do what God's Word says. Now, this began with a thought process. And that thought process, there's four different things I want you to consider as I think about this. Number one is that Christianity should not be divided, that Christ intended the creation of one church. 
That's what you find within the scriptures, that Jesus intended for his disciples to be one, that they be united. And that's some of his final thoughts in John chapter 17 before he's about to be arrested and then crucified. Do you realize how many denominations that there are of Christianity in the world today? Now, I can't tell you a definite answer. Matter of fact, the last answer I got was from 2001, so that was 19 years ago. How many different denominations would you guess for Christianity? Well, at that time, they put the number at 33,830. 33,000 different ways that people says, all right, here's how you serve Jesus Christ. I want you to stop and to think about that. Why not, as they said long ago, just go back and find out what the scriptures have to say and do that. The second thing that they realize is that creeds divide, but Christians should be able to find agreement by standing on the Bible itself. So if a man was to go and to preach for a group of people, he would come in carrying his Bible, but they would also hand him some papers or a booklet that said, this is what we believe. If he were to go somewhere else and carry that same Bible, then he would go through the door and they would hand him, here's a booklet that says what we believe. And the two don't match up. And that's what we're saying about all the different denominations, that there's so many different ways that people are interpreting things from the scripture. Creeds divide. They were saying, why not toss all these things away and just simply open up our Bibles and see what the Bible has to say? The third thing was that ecclesiastical traditions divide, but Christians should be able to find common ground by following the practices as best it can of the early church. So that means let's open up that book of Acts and let's find out how Christians lived at that time and try to do the same thing. Let's look what Paul had to say to the Ephesians or the Philippians or the Thessalonians or any of the others that he wrote about how the church was supposed to be behaving, acting, doing, serving, how it's to be uh, led. Let's look at things like that and let's put those back into practice in this day and this time. Let's stop looking at what some hierarchy of some group says, and let's just simply go to the Bible and let's just do the same thing that those folks did at that time. The fourth thing they said is that the names of human origin divide, but Christians should be able to find common ground by using biblical names for the church and for the individual Christian as well. Why do I call myself whatever? It's because I want people that think like I do to be here with me. And then right across the road, there's another, and they call themselves by something different. Why do they call themselves something different? Because I want to attract people that are thinking like what I'm thinking. I want to teach people to think like what I'm thinking. These men long ago simply said, let's throw all that away. Let's throw all those names away. Let's just go back and do Bible things in Bible ways. And so there are several slogans that came out of what was known as the Restoration Movement. The first one is probably the most famous one, and that's where the scriptures speak, we speak. Where the scriptures are silent, we are silent. So we know what the Bible says. Let's just simply do that. And where... The Bible is silent on something. Well, let's ourselves be silent on that. Let's just simply do things the way that the Bible says to do them. The second thing that they said <clears throat> is that the church of Jesus Christ on earth is essentially, intentionally, and constitutionally one. That's what Jesus wanted. Jesus didn't die on the cross to start thousands of different ways of trying to serve him. He wanted to just very simply do what his word says and put that into practice in our life. And when we look at the Bible, that's what we can simply find. Fourth thing, in essentials, 
unity. In other words, there's some things that we really need to stand for. Here's what the Bible says, and we need to be in agreement on. Second phrase, in opinions, liberty. There are some things that we can vary on. There are some things that certainly are not discussed within God's word. And the third thing that they said, and I think quite often this is lost today, in all things, love. Yet you can see with this idea that I've got my sect and I want people to follow me, that if they're not following me just exactly, then I don't have that tremendous amount of love for the people that are doing something differently. Where's the love gone? We need to be united on what God's word says. But we need to have enough love about ourselves that when there is a difference in opinions that there can, yes, be that liberty. Another phrase they use, no headquarters but heaven, no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible, no law but love, no name but the divine. Another one they use, we are only Christians and the Bible is their only book. Another one they use is back to Jesus, back to the Bible, back to Jerusalem. And they also use be true to the truth. Oppose error, but bear with humanity. There's that idea of love showing up again. And I want you to realize that so many, in fact, if not all of these individuals that began this thought process in the restoration movement was in some type of a denomination. I know and have read stories about some of these men that have gone to a place to preach and just simply opened the Bible and preached what the Bible said, and they were asked not to come back again. Or they were told, you can't be part of our group anymore because you're not teaching what we teach. And he could reply, but I'm teaching what the Bible says. And they had to look at their own selves so many times. And I know so many of these individuals called themselves Christians and were following Christ and were preaching the gospel. And yet when they began to examine some things that they were doing, they said, I got to change. That's just like Josiah said, we have found the book of the law and we're not doing it. We're going to start doing what God's commanded. And so many of these men had not been baptized properly. And when they looked at it and they saw what they did and they saw what the Bible says, even though for years they had been following Christ, they said, I need to do what the Bible said. That's the attitude we need to have about ourselves. This evening I close with four different verses that I want you to think about where this idea is expressed within God's word. First of all, in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11, Peter says, If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. Now that's so important. And I think about that as a minister of the gospel, that when I stand up, I want to be saying what God's word says. And if I'm not saying exactly what God's word says, but I'm saying something that's an opinion, I may be able to state that. We need to just simply stand on what God's word says. In Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5, we find the Hebrew writer is uh, reminding them of something that was said to Moses. Moses was told, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. And his argument in Hebrews chapter 8 is those things that was shown to Moses by God were pictures of things to come pertaining to the church. So you make sure you're doing everything exactly the way I showed you to do it because there's meaning there. Well, the same thing applies to us today. Let's just do exactly what God's word says to do. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, there Paul says, Now, brothers, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, Do not go beyond what is written. So again, let's just simply do what the Bible says to do. Let's speak what the Bible speaks, and let's be silent where the Bible is silent. And then in Revelations chapter 22, verses 18 and 19, 
And I realize that these two verses that I'm about to read uh, really apply to the book of Revelation and only the book of Revelation. But yet these are some principles that are found not word for word, but still throughout God's word, Old Testament and New. And here's what it says. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes words away from the book of this prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. The greatest treasure that we have is God's word. And the truth is, the vast majority of people around this world don't know it, don't have it. And we need to be looking for it and finding it. It's what life is all about. And it's what tells us how to find salvation. So we need to be searching for that and find that and then apply it to our life just like Josiah did for that nation a long time ago. And I would also say this, we are saying this in terms of the church and what the church does, but it applies to us as individuals as well. Are we opening up our Bible to see what the Bible says for me to do? How I should live my life? What are the attitudes and the principles within my life? How do I really serve God? And use that book as a mirror to examine ourselves to see where do I fall short and get back to doing what we should do. May we always be searching for that greatest treasure. Those streets of gold in heaven itself are going to be far more worth than that Fabergé egg that was worth $33 million.